We should be live. Uh, now, so good morning. Here's what we're gonna do. Everybody hit go. And then we're gonna hit share. And now, so we tried that. All right. The I'm watching y'all come on. So I know this is a little bit different introduction. I'll try and clean that up later. Um, but the today uh, is March Madness. Okay, so in our culture, there's a bit of a unique thing going on. So sports fans are all dialed in, tuned in, paying attention to uh, basketball this weekend because college basketball is the biggest... Uh, tournament in athletics right now because it's it's just it's exciting there's 64 68 teams i guess now there's 64 teams that play through a bracket and everybody fills out their bracket and everybody's trying to guess who's going to win and since we're in east tennessee and the vols are doing well this year i know there's people who've picked the vols to go all the way and uh the i grew up in eastern north carolina and there's a couple acc teams in there uh, so Duke and Carolina are always in. I saw I saw one of my East Tennessee pastor friends picked a Duke Carolina national championship, and I was like, "Really, dude? You didn't even pick your balls to go all the way?" Um, and I, I don't at this point have a dog in the hunt. I, I don't, I don't care care um, who wins. I do know that there's going to be an awful lot of people paying attention to college basketball, and with that, there are going to be people uh, who are going to say, as they in the post game interviews after they win the ball game, okay, and they're going to. They're going to ask. Uh, they're going to be interviewing these kids. The kids are going to say, it's all to the glory of God. And there's going to be kids that pipe up and say that. And they're going to say, well, we just play in to the glory of God. And we're going to say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And uh, I, I want to kind of unpack that phrase a little bit. You know, there was a time when I was an athlete. And before the games, we would, we would pray that God would bless our effort. And we would pray always, and we'd have the little devotional, we'd read our Bible uh, a little bit, and uh, we would pray, Lord, let us play to the glory of God. And, and as I stand here looking back on that, that's a bit of an interesting uh, analogy, because we're, we're talking about an athletic game, we're talking about sports, and at the same time, it makes perfect sense, because uh, the Bible says that whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So whether you're talking about playing ball or whether you're talking about uh, being a husband or whether you're talking about being a dad or a grandma, whether you're talking about uh, being an employee, we're supposed to do everything to the glory of God. And as we unpack today, Jesus is going to unpack the greatest glory of God in the text today. Like, how is it that Christ glorifies the Father. What does it mean? What's the ultimate bringing glory to God is what we're going to see in the Bible text today. And uh, it's not winning a ball game, okay, which I'm not diminishing that. But the ultimate thing that brings the Father glory is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It is the crucifixion, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus for our sins is the thing that brings God the most glory. Um, it is not whether or not we win or lose. It is not how we play the game. Like It is ultimately how we live a selfless, Christ-like life that puts others' needs in front of our own and pursues holiness above all other things. So if you would, take your Bibles. We're going to be in John chapter 12. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, in John chapter 12, I will tell you, uh, the text today continues last week's, uh, and I, I just bit off more than I could chew last week. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 12, uh, and we're going to begin reading in verse 27 of John chapter 12. Um, and today we are going to attempt take on the whole text. All right, so John chapter 12, beginning in verse 27, my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice out of heaven said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered, and others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, The voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. 
But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and then he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed many signs before them, yet they were not believing him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory, and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, even many even of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees were not confessing him, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Jesus cried out, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I don't judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you pray with me, Father in heaven, as we seek to look at what glorifies the Father, as we seek to transform our hearts, I pray that you would open our eyes, that the Holy Spirit would dwell among us, that the, in this corporate gathering that you would be uniquely present with us, and that you would help us to see the truths of the scripture and why it matters. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, to understand who you are and what you're like. I pray that you would help us to see how the crucifixion of Christ glorifies you and how we have an opportunity through it to believe. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The, so we're going to unpack this kind of a verse at a time. In John 12, 27, he says, My soul has become troubled. Now what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Like the here, the this is John's recording of Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, John puts it in a different place. Uh, the synoptics all record this as the prayer on the night before the crucifixion. Um, it's probably both, to be very honest. I don't think this is an isolated incident. That Jesus, in his humanity, ha is tempted to forego the cross. The cross is looming. It's a few days away. And like he is tempted continually to avoid the cross, to not go to die. And yet, he says... But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Like Jesus came to go to the cross. That was the plan from eternity past. Like, and Jesus is not going to shirk that. Jesus is not going to be tempted to deny or to disobey. You see, Jesus is the new Adam. Adam was given a choice to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or not. And Adam failed. Adam chose to disobey the Father and to partake of the fruit, and in his disobedience brought death into the world. Because the wages of sin is death. The consequence of disobedience is death. Like, and Jesus is going to obey to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus is not going to walk away from the cross. Like, he's going to say, Father, glorify your name. 
Like, and what, what the essence of that is, is that even in the cross, the Father is going to be glorified. Even in the cross, the Father is going to be glorified. This is the pinnacle of the story. Like, because Jesus wants to glorify the Father above all things. He's not like Adam, who's going to pursue his own selfish desire. The fruit looks good, therefore I'm going to eat it, because God might be holding out on me. Nope. Jesus is going to be different than the first Adam, and he's going to obey even though in his humanity he is tempted not to. Even though in his humanity the cross is painful and agonizing and, and terrifying, he's, he's going to pursue and he's going to persist and he's going to say, your will be done. He's going to say, Father, glorify your name. Like the glory of God is most clearly seen in the cross. The glory of God is most clearly seen in the crucifixion like, and the death, burial, and resurrection. And we're going to unpack that a little more in just a minute because the Father actually answers him out of heaven. This is the third time that the Father speaks from heaven in an audible voice. The other two, according, like in, earlier in John at the baptism, uh, Jesus uh, is baptized and the Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well, like, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Like, and it, we get that in John chapter 1. Like the other time the voice from heaven speaks is at the transfiguration, but that's just to a small, that's to Peter, James, and John. That's not to a, a crowd. And here John also records, verse 28, then a voice came out of heaven. He responds to Jesus' declaration, Father, glorify your name. The Father responds, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I think the Father says, I already have. The Father's already glorified his name because he sent Jesus to be the image of God on earth. Like, Jesus is going to say later in the text that he who has seen the Father, or seen me, has seen the Father. That he is the perfect embodiment of God's character in a man. Like, and God says, I already have. I've already glorified my name through the works that you have done and the life that you have lived. And I'm going to glorify it again through this crucifixion. Verse 29, the crowd responds, so the crowd of people who stood by heard it saying, but it thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. I think the, the booming voice from heaven creates a little bit of, I mean, if you heard a voice out of heaven, like, would you listen to it? I mean, no, man, that was just a, you just thought you heard the thunder say something. Like, nope. Like, the, the, there are people who are, no, clearly the thunder didn't say, clearly the, that wasn't a voice from heaven, you must be crazy, you're hearing things. But others said, no, like an angel has spoken. Like, and Jesus answered and says, the voice didn't come for my sake. Jesus knows where he stands before the Father. The voice came for your sakes. Like, now judgment is upon the world, and the ruler of this world will be cast out. Like, this is a pronouncement of judgment upon Satan. Like, so Jesus is a new Adam who's going to obey to the point of death, even death on the cross. And though the tempter deceived Eve and Adam, he's not going to successfully deceive Christ. The ruler of this world, who's the devil, the serpent of old, is going to be cast out at the crucifixion. He's going to lose. Genesis 3 says that the serpent is going to crush the, uh, the Jesus is going to crush the serpent's head and he's going to bruise him on the heel. Like, Genesis 3 predicted the cross because Jesus is going to get his heel bruised here. But he's going to crush the serpent's head. He's going to be cast out. Verse 32 says, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. If you'll remember from last week, the group of men that came and posed the question, we would see Jesus, were not Jews. They were Greeks. And this is, this is still the same audience. So this is still the Greeks from last week who've come. And Jesus is going to declare to them, I'm going to draw all men to myself, whether they're Jew or Greek, slave or free man, male or female, it doesn't matter. God's going to draw all men to himself. Men from every tribe and every tongue and every nation are going to be included because of Christ. Like, that we're going to make this new thing that we're going to call the church, and it's going to be men from Jews and Gentiles that are going to come together in one group. It's no longer just the family of Abraham biologically that are included in the promise. We're going to get the promise. And there's some confusion around that. Verse 33, Jesus indicates this was the kind of death he was going to die, that he was going to be lifted up. He's, 
John's commentary is that just in case you missed it, Jesus is definitively talking about the crucifixion here. That Jesus is talking about his lifting up onto a cross to die publicly. This was a shameful, scornful death reserved for the worst of criminals in Roman times. Like, the crucifixion is not a nice way to die. Like, the crucifixion was how they, this is how they killed robbers who were persistent in their robbery. It's how they killed thieves. It's how they killed rapists. It's how they killed the worst of society, was dragged out. And you know why they crucified them? They crucified them because it was a public display in order to discourage other people from committing the same crimes. Like, now, it actually was reasonably effective. It's horrible and inhumane and cruel and all of those things. But people knew if you kill somebody, they're going to drag you out on a hillside, nail you to a cross, and let you die of suffocation over a 24-hour period. Okay? In a miserable, brutal way. Like, it was intended as a public display of this is the worst of humanity. And this is the worst of humanity. And we're gonna, this is how we treat that. Yet here, Jesus is going to be treated like the worst kind of sinner. Though he has already glorified the Father by living a sinless life to this point. He's never committed a wrong act. He's never done anything uh, that would disobey the Father in any way. And he's going to indicate, uh, he's going to die the worst kind of death. The death that we all deserve. The crowd's a little confused. Imagine that. Uh, the crowd answered, We have heard that the, out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So the crowd's going, Wait a minute. We thought if you're the Messiah, you're supposed to stay. You're supposed to rule and reign. And you're supposed to cast off Rome and set up a kingdom. And so the crowd that had been shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is now confused a little bit. Wait a minute. I thought, the, we, I thought you were supposed to stay forever. Like, what do you mean you're going to be lifted up? What do you mean you're going to be crucified? That doesn't make any sense to us. Like, Jesus is, this is a reference to the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7. And the Son of Man is going to come, and he's going to rule, and he's going to reign. And Jesus is going to be that Son of Man out of Daniel chapter 7, who's going to rule and reign. Like, and Jesus is going to answer their question a bit bleakly. He's not going to declare clearly like that he's the, the Son of Man from Daniel 7. Like He uses that title of himself a number of times in Scripture, and we know that's who he is. Uh, the, the Jesus answers and just simply commands their obedience. Like, and this is beautiful to me because we don't always have to understand everything to believe and obey. Like, and so in this challenge of unbelief, we don't always have to understand all of the intricate doctrines of Scripture before we believe. We don't have to have a theological degree before we come to faith. And so Jesus is simply going to say, quit asking diverting questions. You're missing the point. Like Jesus is going to command them in verse 35, for a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness doesn't know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. And Jesus said, you're missing the point. I want you to, the, the, the son of man question is actually one that is a bit of a, they're steering the ship the wrong way. So I don't know if you've ever been in a gospel conversation where you're trying to explain to them uh, how, that Christ died for their sins, that they, he paid the penalty that they ought to pay, and that if they put their faith in his resurrection, and his, then they can have faith, that they can have eternal life with the Father. If you've ever tried to explain that to somebody, people get all kinds of confused, and they start asking questions that have nothing to do with the main idea. Like, and I, I was sharing the gospel with a, a Russian guy one time, and we got to the end, and I said, would you like to give your heart to Jesus? Like, and I was excited, because we've, we've been two hours round and round. I've shared the gospel like 17 times in two hours, trying to get it as clear as possible. My Russian wasn't that good. His English wasn't that good, and we're trying to blend. And I'm praying, Lord, would you? And he asked me, get to the end, so would you like to give your heart to Jesus? And he says, what is God? <sighs> All right, back to the beginning. Because uh, he didn't get it. I'm like, all right, so we go back to the beginning. I'm at, we started, uh, and he never gave his life to Christ because he was distracted by, he couldn't understand God is too big a concept. I mean, the essence of his argument was, I can't understand God because he's too big to understand. 
Like, and Jesus is, I- I'm here. I've done these works. Like, I am the light of the world. Believe while you can see me. Believe while I'm here. Like, become sons of light. What does it take to become a son of light? Belief. It gets faith alone. It is sola fide, man. It is faith alone. Jesus says, believe in me. I'm here. You've seen the works that I've done. You've heard this voice out of heaven just now that said, uh, that declared that I've already glorified my name and will glorify it again in you. Like, and Jesus is saying, quit being distracted by things you don't understand. Like, stay on task. Like, believe in me while I'm here. Like, and sometimes in our own lives, we get distracted by questions that don't matter. Like, and we don't, we don't give our hearts to Christ in the way that we should. Like, we know people who won't give their hearts to Christ because they're confused about certain issues. I, 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 I read an article this week on why this isn't true, okay? Like, why substitutionary atonement, why Jesus dying on the cross for our sins is not uh, accurate. This isn't what God happened. This is what happened here. That Jesus was an example, but they didn't actually die for our sins. And I want you to understand, that's, that's heresy. That's not true. Like, Jesus, look, what's clear from the scriptures is that Jesus is going to die in perfect obedience to the Father. Like, in perfect uh, fulfillment of God's plan. Because we know that the wages of sin is death. We know that the consequence of Adam's unbelief and disbelief and disobedience is that death entered the world, and it wasn't supposed to be this way. The world is not supposed to be filled with cancer and sorrow and sadness, and we know that because at the end of the story, those things all get removed. That if we read all the way to the end of the Bible and we get to Revelation and we read that the new heavens and the new earth are a place with no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, no more darkness. The, all of those things are a consequence of our disobedience. And if you look around the room, none of us is perfect, okay? And if we're transparent with our own selves, we've all committed the, we've all broken all the Ten Commandments, okay? We've all loved something more than we love God. Even for a season, we've all loved something more than we loved God. Like, we've all broken the Sabbath. We've all, we've all worked on a Sunday and, and skipped a day of rest for a season. We've all uh, disobeyed our parents at some point. I promise. Uh, I love you, Mom and Dad. Sorry. Uh, like, we've all... Uh, I've been teaching my kids the word covet. Okay? Because uh, the last minute is you should not covet. Which means you shouldn't want other people's stuff. Okay? Kids get this wrong all the time because they all that would, I want it this morning before church. Like, Lily, Hosea comes in, he's reporting. Like, Lily will not let me play with a horse. Like, Lily comes in and defends herself. Like, Dad, I don't, like, why do I always have to share? Like, like, Lily, like, how many horses do you have? She's counting in her head. Three, five, eight. She's got eight horses. Like, okay, if your brother had eight cars and uh, he was playing with them and he asked you, if you ask, brother, can I play with one of your cars? And he said, no, I don't want to share today. How would you feel? So bad. I said, why are you treating him differently? Are you putting his needs in front of your own? Now, in his heart, he wants what she has. And it doesn't matter what. They always want the other kid's toy. So th- th- we're kind of parenting through both sides of the selfishness issue here. Okay, why do you want what she has? Okay, because she's playing happily with her horses and you want them because she's playing with them. Don't you have trucks or things that you can play with? No, I'm play- I want what she has. That's how kids are. That's how we are. That's called coveting. When we want what other people have, like, and we all struggle with it. Like, we all, uh, we've all told a lie. Like, we've all told little white lies. We've probably all told some big lies that got us in trouble at some point. Uh, we've all taken things that didn't belong to us at some point. That's called stealing. Like, we've all, if we're honest, broken the law of God. Like, none of us is perfect. Well, how many sins does it take to make us worthy of death? One. First one, you're done. Why? Because God is so holy that he can't be in the presence of sin. Like, it only takes one. 
It only takes one sin to, to be worthy of death. And so when you talk to someone and says, I'm a good person and I'm going to ultimately pay the penalty for my sins, like, yes, you are. You are going to be separated from God for all of eternity in a place the Bible calls hell, uh, paying the penalty for your sins. Like you're going to be punished for your unbelief. Or you can go, you know what? The truth of the scripture is that Jesus never sinned. And he's going to be lifted up. He's going to die the death that we deserve. He's going to die the death that I deserve. Because I am a lying, cheating, adulterer at heart. Like, who was wicked. Who had to repent and turn from my wickedness and put my faith in Christ. Because he lived the life I couldn't live. And by putting my faith in him, now I can walk with Jesus. By putting my trust in him, now I have access to the Father. Not because I'm good enough. I'm not but because he is gracious to me, because he is uh, patient with me, and because he calls me to believe. Jesus then spoke these things, and I'm going I'm to accelerate a little bit. Hang on. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself. But though he had performed many signs, so many signs among them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, the Lord who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is a quotation of Isaiah 53, uh, which is going to be the, the, the servant, one of the servant psalms, and it talks about the crucifixion of Christ in Isaiah, and the, they did, just missed it. That the Jews are hardened, that God's not going to let them believe, like that a portion of them are going to disbelieve so that Christ will go to the cross. Because if they all believe, Jesus doesn't die. And if there's no shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That Jesus has to go to the cross. And so they aren't going to believe, verse 39, for this reason. They could not believe, for Isaiah has said again, and this is a quotation from Isaiah 6. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, so they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. These things I said because he saw the Father's glory and he spoke of him. Think that, that there's a hardening that is taking place. So it, it does help us understand why. Look, you people have seen all of these miracles. You've heard a voice from heaven. You've seen Lazarus raised from the dead. You've seen three years of miracles, and you still don't believe. Why not? And the answer is there's a hardening of heart that's taken place that was predicted in Isaiah so that Christ would go to the cross. Nothing's going to derail God's plan. Yet... Even in the midst of that, some believe. Verse 42, nevertheless, even, many even of the rulers believed in him, because of, but because of the Pharisees weren't confessing him, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, this is kind of an interesting verse because I think the belief here is genuine. Like, and sometimes they, the theologians go back and forth. Like, is the faith of these folks genuine if they won't confess Christ before the before their friends, if they're afraid, if they demand the approval of men, and I would say yes for two reasons. One, the Holy Spirit hasn't been given. Like, and the Holy Spirit is ultimately the power that we have to share our faith with others. The Holy Spirit is what makes us, empowers us to be witnesses. Like, and the Holy Spirit comes later, and they don't have him yet. So I'm going to cut them some slack here because they don't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that's going to empower them to witness to others and empower them to stand up. And they, they're they afraid of being thrown out. Now, we know a few of these guys' belief is genuine. We know Nicodemus' faith is genuine. Like, we know that about a week later, five days, whatever, uh, that Joseph of Arimathea, who's one of the leaders of the Sanhedrin, is going to take Jesus' body and put it in his own tomb. Like, because his faith is genuine. Like, and so there are men whose faith is genuine they are believing who aren't ready to take a public stand yet. But that's going to change when the Holy Spirit comes. Because when the Holy Spirit indwells us as believers, which takes place at the moment of salvation for us, like now we're going to be responsible to confess Christ publicly. We're going to be responsible to share him with others because he has transformed our hearts. Like Jesus cries out, and I'll land the plane here. He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. One who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and doesn't keep them, 
I don't judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects my me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me as a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So here Jesus declares, if you don't just believe in me, like that we believe in a triune God, that he is fully God and fully man. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like, we are Trinitarian. There's one God manifested in three persons. And Jesus says, if you've seen the, me, you've seen the Father. Because Jesus has lived the Father's character perfectly. And Jesus says, I came as light to offer you hope. And if you believe in me, you will have eternal life. And Jesus, is inter Jesus comes to save the world, not to judge it. You know what's going what's gonna to judge them? Jesus says, is if you reject my teachings... You're not rejecting me. If you reject my declaration that I am the light, if you reject my teachings, then you're rejecting the Father who sent me. Like, and there are going to be those in Jesus' day and in the present day who reject Christ's teachings outright and say, that's not true. Jesus didn't die for our sins. I'm going to die for my sins. There are people who teach that. Like, from pulpits. Like, who call themselves Christians? It's terrifying. Like the because I read one of them the other day, and they're a pastor. Okay, like th that that's heresy. Okay, like we believe that Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sins because Jesus says this is it, belief. And He calls all men to Himself, and He gives us an opportunity over and over and over again to believe. Like, and if we do. Verse 47, he who hears my sayings and doesn't keep them. Like, oh no, hold on, verse 46. So that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness, right? We, we don't want to be in the dark. We want to be in the light. We want to walk as children of light, which means we're going to be different from the world around us. Like, light is different than darkness. And if we're children of light, if we're sons of light, if we're sons of Jesus, if we are genuinely following the teachings of Jesus... We're going to look different than the world around us. That means in our interactions, there's going to be a Christ-likeness. There's going to be a kindness and a gentleness and a humility and a patient love and a loving exhortation away from sin, if we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. And if somebody is tied up in a lifestyle of sin, we're going to love them anyway. And we're going to offer them hope because I want you to understand that faith comes at the same time as repentance and that it doesn't proceed, that the person doesn't get their life right with Jesus first. They don't have to clean themselves up to come to Christ. Like, they come as they are. And Christ changes us after. Like, that there's a repentance and a turning from, but the character change happens after. It happens as a result of walking as sons of light. If you've not given your life to Christ, may today be the day. Would you, would you put your faith in him? Would you put your faith in the finished work of Christ? Would you put your faith in, in the one who loves you enough to die for you? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I thank you that Christ came. I thank you that he died. I thank you that on the third day he rose in power and declared death destroyed and that he, put, uh, that he declared victory over the devil and the ruler of this world will be cast out. I thank you that death is crushed to death and that we can have life with you eternally if we put our faith in you if we put our faith in christ if we will simply believe you will come in via the holy spirit and transform us into the image of your beloved son over a lifetime and one day there will be a place where there's no more tears no more pain and no more death and we will walk face to face with you lord may today be the day of repentance May the day be today that we return from our unbelief. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.